Hey, seems like we have quorum, everybody. Thanks for all at the very, very last second coming, coming together for the somewhat haphazardly um, pulled together Google chat. Um, maybe we can do a little bit of a recap about how we got to this point. Um, who initiated this initial exchange? Was that you, Jerry? Yeah, I have a question. Who, who, who is everyone here? <laughs> sure. Well, we can go. We can go down the line, I guess. Why don't everybody uh, just introduce yourself and say where you're, say where you're calling in from? So this is Rick from Yehudi. I'm here in the call and crawl. So I'll be five minutes here, Francisco. So how do we know what left to right is? Uh, is it the same on everyone's display? Like Gina's leftmost at the moment? I don't think it yeah. works. I don't think Google Hangout works no. like that. <laughs> Why don't I just call on people? Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole. I, what, what do you want me to? I don't know. It's San Francisco. I'm Nicole. I'm from San Francisco. I care a lot about making our community safe. Yeah. Spuds? Um, Spuds, Manu, Smith. I work with the guys at yuhudi.com. We do a bunch of shows. I used to teach, and I do care a lot about making our community safe. Awesome. Gina. I'm mute. I'm Gina. I'm from Austin, Texas. And I formerly spent a lot of time uh, studying and teaching feminism and women's studies, and keep doing that in other fields. Including, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Jerry? Uh, I'm Jerry. I have a blog called Wandering and Pondering, Washington, D.C. I also care about things. I sense a theme here. Mikey Pedroza. Hi, I'm Mikey, and hopefully you can hear me. I'm not even sure because I haven't talked yet. But, um, uh, I'm I absolutely uh, unqualified to talk about uh, very serious subjects, but I am very qualified to talk about um, the past, present, and the future of the scene that I grew up in. And I think growing up into it as a kid and now being an adult, things have to change, and change is good, change is inevitable, and that's what we're here to talk about. Okay. Uh, just for clarification, are we recording now? Okay. Oh, are we? I thought we were. Okay. Uh, let's go to Rebecca. Hi, I am Rebecca. I have a blog called Dance World Takeover. Um, I am also totally not academically qualified to talk about these things, but I don't think that really matters because I have a lot of lived experience um, with these types of issues and obviously I care a lot. Also. Please. Bobby White. Hi. Uh, I'm Bobby White. I teach dance uh, around the world, and I run a blog called Swung Over, and I care very much about making our community safer. Awesome. So that's everybody. Um, Maybe if we could get started just kind of saying how we got to this point and the sort of recent events that have culminated in us coming together for this conversation. Jerry, can you give us a quick recap about um, what's transpired? Um, yeah, a lot of things got up, uh, a lot, a lot, there was a lot of things that came up before the blog post uh, was posted last week. So I'm just going to jump in where I came in into this story, which was uh, about right before the holidays, uh, right before the Christmas holidays, uh, a gentleman, I uh, probably shouldn't use that word, but a person by the name of Mo Jones uh, started friending a lot of people on Facebook, and uh, a lot of people did not realize that Mo Jones was a convicted, a convicted sex offender, a convicted sex offender who used to be an active member of the Lindy Hop community. Um, once that got, once, uh, once start, people started realizing what was happening, uh, we all put out the call to, let, to warn people that this guy was out there. For some reason, he was just friending everyone. 
I just want to let them know that this guy was out there. Uh, right after that, uh, Sarah Sullivan, who is a very close friend of mine, came to me with her story uh, concerning Stephen Mitchell. And uh, I've known Sarah for a very long time. Um, at that point, she had been gotten to a point where she's working through a lot of her issues because of the because of her experience, and uh, she was starting to realize that because of her experience, um, other people may be seriously affected by Stephen Mitchell's continued presence in the Lindy Hop scene. Uh, so, uh, over the next few weeks, uh, she well, she was telling a select number of people, uh, just trying to. Not necessarily with the intent of spreading the news, but mostly for her sake. Um, but also, there was this this glimmer of an idea that maybe other people should know, the wider community should know. And so we were talking about that for several weeks, um, till about last week she finally sent me uh, her uh, latest draft of her statement. I had not read anything. She had told me that what was going on, uh, and then I finally read it, and. Uh, Gave her some feedback about it, and after a little bit more consideration, she finally posted. Um, I don't want to. Uh, I'm not sure how much I should summarize the actual post because the post is long. It speaks for itself. Um, talks about her experience uh, being abused by Stephen Mitchell. Uh, since then, about four women, uh, four named women, have uh, come forward with their own stories. Uh, there are a couple other anonymous uh, stories. All these stories are on her blog post. Uh, and also, there have been many, many other countless stories of women in the dance scene who have had very negative experiences. Uh, some of them have posted on that blog. Uh, there's a lot of chatter all over the place. And now we're, and so now we're here uh, at the crossroads, so to speak. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to take it from here. Sure. So our goal this evening is not really to um, give like a blow-by-blow -blow of everything that has transpired on Facebook as a result of Sarah's post um, or in the like bigger Lindy Hoff community. Um, what we're mostly interested in right now is talking about how we move forward with this information and make the community a better, safer place for everyone involved. So we're using this as a, a jump start to all of us to come up with ways to make communities safer. So that's why we're here tonight. I, uh, when you mentioned the, uh, the other people coming out, I had a, uh, a student of mine from a camp write me a message that said, that she too had had an inappropriate experience with Stephen on the dance floor. She said that it didn't, like she said he was drunk and it didn't lead to anything. Or, or I mean, she got out of the situation fast and stuff. And But she was, like, that one person telling me that has to represent so many more. And that just really, like, it really hit me hard. Uh, I mean, all of this hit me hard. But, like, that particular instance of, like, man... Sorry. No, but I've. Uh, I think that's an appropriate response. I mean, that's. I think a lot of people are just kind of grappling with this. Uh, uh, the speed of, I've been telling people the speed of the internet kind of trips me out sometimes because I've been talking to Sarah about this for quite a, a few weeks, and once the blog post hit the internet last week, we're. We were already prepared to go to. We were, well, we were bracing for the, uh, uh, bracing for, the, uh, uh, the response, which turned out much better than we would actually ever hoped it would. Uh, the the Lindy Hop community has been very supportive, uh, but even still, it's we're about five days since, um, and we were about ready to go to have this sort of conversation with everyone else, but we're still realizing there are quite a number of people out there who are they are still grappling with this. They still don't understand it. I know quite a number of people. The thing I've discovered is that the closer you people we get to 
or the people who are closer to, to Stephen have, they're slower to respond, not necessarily because, well, they just don't know how to respond. Because this has been, he was, he's been a very integral part of our community. And uh, it's a, a lot of people are still sort of shell shocked. Um, and I hope that this conversation, uh, I mean, it's happening in a lot of places, but I'm hoping this conversation will help people guide to where their energy should go next. I hope. Yeah, I think uh, part of that uh, that I wanted to say about uh, the shell shocked feeling is exactly what I'm going through. Uh, after reading the the post, uh, the blog on Wednesday. Uh, I couldn't really react to it. I, I knew it was going to be big, and I knew it was going to be strong reaction from, from everybody in Lindy Hop. Uh, but I was getting ready for an event, and I couldn't deal with it, so I kind of pushed it to the side. Throughout the week, it kept pushing up and, and getting getting me in very, 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 very horrible mindsets for the weekend that I just pushed through. And then today, it hit me very hard, because out here in uh, Southern California, it's all of a sudden really rainy after a perfect weekend. Uh, and I, I am not ashamed to say that I spent most of the day feeling very afraid, feeling very confused and crying a lot because I would count myself as very close to Stephen for the past few years and I feel betrayed and ashamed at the same time. Um, not to any extent as the blog would be, but from a friend or maybe even just from a man's point of view like he was I would call him a dear friend and all of this just completely shook up my world to a point where I could not function today I could barely drive home so uh, that that was my reaction and I'm glad that we're here today talking with everybody and showing everybody that there's lots of different ways we're all gonna react to this but and that's fine but the one way we should hopefully start going towards is together with making everything safer and making everybody safer within our community as much as we can. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's really well put, Mikey. Um, Gina, so I know that you're kind of in a unique position as both a member of our community as well as someone who's kind of studied and thought a lot about these issues. I'm wondering what are your thoughts on what you've been observing in the community response and things that you're either surprised about or just noticing? Um, it's a great question. So I think my, my initial thoughts were that I was really pleased and relieved to see um, what is undeniably overwhelming support um, for Sarah and all of the women who have bravely come forward and share their own stories. Um, I think that the defensive uh, reactions, the denial reactions, the victim blaming reactions have been um, definitely the exception. I'm not surprised to see them. Um, I think that's just kind of part of the society that we live in, unfortunately. Um, but so many people have been quick to respond to those kinds of posts. Um, I think it's reassuring. For myself, I think, as other people have said, I, I really think it's important to try to shift the conversation to what we're going to do about the sort of culture in Lindy Hop, how to make it a safe place for everyone, and um, really try to institute some changes in our community that will make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again or can't happen again um, as much as is within our power. I know it's a really uh, emotional situation for a lot of people with regard to the specifics of it being Stephen, but um, it's so much larger than just what Stephen did. Um, and I, I think that's really important to keep in mind. Yeah, totally. Um, so while we're talking about this, one thing I want to make sure that I just say so that's out there on the table is that we are not at all trying to take away from um, giving the victims their opportunity to be heard. Um, this is just 
the way that we can we feel we can meaningfully give back. So our discussions here are not trying to like push everyone beyond their grieving period, beyond their um, sort of getting out the feelings about their experiences. But this is our way of trying to process it and uh, turn it into something that we can do well. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, so like everyone else, since this happened, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the past, but um, trying to construct a meaningful way to um, make the future a brighter place for me, for everyone else in the scene. Um, so, and I, the angrier I get about um, people's experiences in the scene, the more I read about um, passing encounters with some guy on the dance floor who tried to kiss them or, you know, some, you know, not everything revolves around Stephen. Our whole culture, not just Lindy Hop, but um, Western culture as a whole is pervaded by the sort of rape culture that we kind of have to get to the bottom of. And so I've just been thinking about ways that we can institute practices in our scenes to make it a better place. And I would actually love to get more organizers involved in this conversation in the future because um, we are just a limited subset of people who are who care, who um, blog or vlog or post videos about the dance scene. So we are by no means representative of the whole. Um, and as such, I would love to involve more people who are in different roles in the community to see what they have to offer. So with that said, let me throw a few ideas out there. You guys tell me what you think. If they're great ideas, bad ideas, why? If you say yes, and I think we can actually do better than that and do this, then that's great. But maybe just some jumping off points. So the way that I've been thinking about this is that there's really two parts to this. There's addressing misconduct to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And then there's noticing warning signs so we can prevent it in the first place. So I think that maybe where the first is concerned, some ideas that I've thought of are... Um, so Lindy Focus this year had this Safe Spaces project where anyone who felt that something, that they were being treated inappropriately, who felt like someone was taking advantage of them or just had uncomfortable experiences of that nature, could come and talk to someone in person if they wanted or I think they could email or call as well um, and tell someone in the organization about them. Knowing that th we would, we being those who are involved in safe spaces, would pass along as much or as little information as um, the person wanted and if they wanted to, the information would go straight to the organizers who personally handled any situation that came up that needed intervention if the person wanted. It was all strictly voluntary. Um, so I would love to see policies like that enacted where not only are there codes of conduct, and I think those are absolutely vital, but that there's people who are visible and accessible and there to talk to anyone about anything that comes up just to e either be heard or to take action. I think that's something that I would love to see more events do. I mean, you have people at the door um, checking wristbands. It doesn't take that many more people to make something like a safe space happen. Um, in terms of preventing this sort of thing from happening in the future, hopefully if, if anything happens and comes to an organizer's attention, they can ban that person from the event they can tell other organizers what happened and have them banned from other events. If they are a teacher or a DJ or a volunteer, then they can be removed from those roles and prevented from doing so in the future. I think that the key part, though, is going to be spreading information between and among events. Um, I also want to note that although I don't want anyone to feel like they are constantly under scrutiny, for um, anyone who has a grudge against them to um, say, oh, I experienced this terrible thing with so-and-so. I'm going to 
make up this story about them. I think that's an extraordinarily rare case. And um, I would honestly rather err on the side of someone being accused of something that they hadn't done and then saying, I didn't do this and here's why, than risk what we have right now, which is a lot of women who have gone unheard for a long time. So just putting that out there. Um, one thing that I would love to see is people in the scene who are knowledgeable about um, warning signs of abusive behavior. If we could take advantage of that information and disperse it among everyone, I think that would be really great. I think everyone needs to be informed about what the, this behavior looks like, specifically in terms of taking advantage of situations of power, whether that be age or instructor-student relationships or when there's alcohol involved. Um, but I also think that we need to disambiguate specific abusive actions by um, people who are probably doing other things that we can't see and general rape culture because there's a lot of signals in our community that are not sexual assault themselves, but who make a pervasive error that is permissive of those kind of things and possibly encourage and imply that it's okay to take advantage of people. I, I'm specifically thinking about, for example, like if someone's passed out drunk and you draw on their face, or I know that there was like teabagging going around a few years ago and it seemed hilarious at the time. Um, but the more that I reflect on those kinds of things, the more they seem to imply that when someone loses control in that way, that you then have agency over their body that they haven't given you. Um, so that's just one example, and I would love it if we could take a closer look at our culture in general, and I know we'll probably lose a lot of jokes over this because a lot of jokes are funny because they're inappropriate and they tickle us in that way that's like borderline and titillating and I think we kind of have to give up on some of that stuff in order to have a safer space. So those are just some of the things I was thinking. I want to give everyone else a chance to talk. There's more stuff but I figure that's like enough fodder for a jumping off point. I, I really have a quick question. question. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> this is going to happen probably a lot. We all have suggestions. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go to Jerry's question. Go for Jerry. Was there anything uh, in terms of the in terms of the safe space policy for Lindy Focus? Was there ever uh, was the contingency? Was there a contingency in case someone had an issue about the organizers themselves? Was there any kind of uh, plan? To the, like, what kind of reassurance from the organizers do you get that, you know, so, uh, that everything would be taken seriously, even if it would just be against them? Um, I actually don't remember if there was anything. It was rather informal, and I think that um, organizers will probably refine it for the future. It's just sort of a test run. I don't think there was anything in there specifically about if something goes horribly wrong in a situation with one of the organizers, like what you would do in that case. And I think that is a great case and should be addressed because organizers are humans like anyone else. And it's it's something that we should be prepared for. Okay. Mikey, you were going to jump in? Uh, yeah, well, I just I was wondering to pose a question to everybody, not just Nicole, but like, the idea that we we have, <laughs> up until recently, felt like a lot of us have lived in this scene, and yeah, there's things that piss us off and things that like make us uncomfortable, and we've heard stories, and uh, and honestly, have probably have been part of. But is it a a lot more? Is it sorry? Is it a thing about trying to restrict? these ideas that we kept free for so long and we felt like we had a comfortable place or is it just really just making it all just kind of feel like back to the real world you know so saying like I, you know when people say oh I'm gonna go dancing for the weekend and then at the end of the weekend okay back to the real world are we really trying to I mean I hate that I hate that saying anyways but like 
are we trying to reconnect with the rest of the world, or are we trying to create a better one that we can manage better? And I and I say manage as opposed to control. I think that we're working to make it better than the average experience in the rest of the world. I think that we have an opportunity because we are a smaller and um, more closely tied community where it's a lot easier to disseminate information among people. Um, and I think that we also probably care more than the average random sample of people in any geographic area. So I think we're maybe trying to set a model for ways that other communities can handle this sort of thing. I know there are other communities that are handling the same issues, but I would like us to be on the forefront of it. Yeah, and yeah. I think for the most part we have been, especially when, when, when we talk about other scenes. I mean, we're not going to go into that, but other scenes, like even the simple things like how people communicate with each other, uh, whether it be in person or over electronically, like emails and stuff. I'm convinced over and over again that our community of Lindy Hop is way better than pretty much everybody else. And, and that may be a point of pride, but you know what? I, I've proven it a lot. And socially, uh, that translates into when you're on the dance floor, what's, when you bump into somebody, whether it's your fault or not, and you're both dancing, usually they're going to say, I'm going to say 90% of the time, which is better than anywhere else in the entire world. If you've ever been in New York and you walk down the street, you probably hear nothing or obscenities thrown at you. And then here, I feel like it's a lot easier. And, and just from that point, I feel like, just like Nicole was saying, and I was hoping you were going to say this, this, that idea that we want to do better than just the, the, the status quo of the rest of the world. Yeah, well, to, to the point of, like, being proactive and establishing a culture in our community um, that's really going to... Um, hopefully help prevent a lot of this stuff. I think Rebecca has written a lot of really wonderful posts, and I would love to hear from her um, about it. But I was thinking especially of um, what you've written about how anyone can always turn down a dance. You want to talk about it? Yeah, yeah. The, um, there's a... I went, okay, so I'll just go ahead and say when I um, started dancing, I was kind of socially awkward and felt hard to sort of get in and be friends with cool people, you know, this is the same story kind of everybody has. Um, and I noticed in myself I had this sort of sense of um, entitlement, like why don't these people ask me to dance, it's their responsibility to make me feel a certain way. And I've um, subsequently noticed, um, as I've been dancing for a bit longer, noticed that with, um, with other people but for different reasons. For example, um, you know, men would ask me to dance, and if I said, oh, you know, I don't know, I'm not really feeling like it, or anything that wasn't, oh, yeah, totally, sometimes there would be a sense of, like, well, why not? What, are you doing something right now? Are you tired? And um, to build off of what um, Nicole was saying earlier, I, I agree that there's a lot of um, other behaviors that are related to manipulative, abusive, predatory sexual behaviors um, that are also present in other places. Um, and I was talking about this with my husband earlier today. We both agree that it's really hard to say, well, you can't rape or assault anyone, but you're allowed to manipulate people into dancing with you or coerce them into dancing with you or, you know, shove them around in the dance floor. We're not going to say anything about that. We're just going to make sure that nobody rapes or assaults them. So it's kind of like, you know, you, you kind of got to step up and say, these things are all related. Um, and I wasn't specifically thinking about um, rape culture when I was writing about um, not, like, trying to, like, dispel the feel, your feelings of entitlement um, when you ask people to dance. But, I mean, it, all, it, it really spills over. Uh, and I hope that people will, um, specifically men or people who are, influential or highly respected in in the dancing will very uh, or will will look inside themselves and try to think of where they might have contributed to this not purposefully but probably in, inadvertently um, and say how can like what have I done that might have contributed what have I done that might have 
shown some tolerance for these inappropriate, entitled, or abusive behaviors. And then, why didn't I say anything? And even better, what what do I need that would have helped me say something? Like, um, for example, my husband and I talked about this, and he he was saying he was he doesn't speak up to say, hey, don't do that to that woman, she's obviously not enjoying that because he's afraid of um, verbal confrontation and he doesn't know how to handle that. And I said, I am afraid of speaking up when I see someone doing something inappropriate or unsafe because I'm afraid of verbal confrontation and of being physically assaulted by the guy. So it's really important to think about the different reasons people have for not speaking up and also um, what's stopping, or not just what's stopping them, but like, what could they, uh, what could we do, what do they need to speak up? Like, what do, what do people need to do the right thing? Like, my husband needs a policy to refer back to, so he can walk up to the guy and say, no, it says here in this policy, I have, I have ironclad, my case is ironclad, you can't debate with me, you can't shout me down, my case is ironclad, whereas I need like another, I need an actual guy to come up with me to another man to say, you can't assault her because I'm bigger than you. <laughs> so we need, we need different things. And he, he was much more interested in having an anonymous way to report behaviors. And I'm more confrontational. I'm willing to do that. And I'm much more interested in just having people back me up if, if I'm going to say, hey, don't, whatever. You, you know, everyone has their own ideas of what inappropriate behaviors are. So um, that's just something I wanted to throw out there. Yeah, that's really that's really true. I mean, I, right before coming out of this, I was watching, uh, trying to get myself in the, in the mode and, and doing my uh, study, I guess. I'm studying this whole thing. And I stumbled across this uh, uh, video on YouTube about privilege. And it completely dispelled the idea of what I thought privilege meant. Uh, I remember... Uh, a conversation I had with somebody about privilege, and they looked at me and they said, "You'll never know how it feels like to be like this." And I'm like, "I'm a brown person. I, I I drive a Mercedes and I get this." And I thought it was that, and I thought it was this like privilege of like the white privilege, because I've heard that so much in my ears. But then I looked at I looked at this and I read up on it, and it's really just just that I will never know what it is to be have to have to have the like exactly what, like Rebecca said like. I, I don't need someone else to come up to another guy and be like, hey, you're acting like a total jerk. Stop it. You know? Like, I don't have to feel like I'm, I'm, I'm threatened. I just, I just do it, you know? So that part of it is really, really big, I think. I think it would be really great to um, put together a list of, like, the modes in which people operate. If we could, um, I don't know, have a list somewhere of um, just what Rebecca was talking about, um, like I, I would, but I am afraid of blank. So that we can, you know, eliminate all these roadblocks that are standing between people and talking about the things that they see. Um, maybe we'll figure out a way to like put that in the comments of this video whenever we put it up on YouTube or something like that. But um, I think that would be a useful thing for event planners to have, so that, you know, let's say safe spaces goes forward in the future. There should be an anonymous way to um, let people know that things are happening. And I think that was there. And then there should be people available to support you if you want to go um, make sure, like, in the moment, you stop a terrible situation from happening. I'm always concerned that I don't want to remove the agency of the person who I am imagining is the victim um, by saying, this isn't what she wants when I am not in her shoes. But at the same time, I feel like it's pretty likely that she's not enjoying this. Um, then maybe it's up to her to tell me, like, no, this is fine. And I just need to be willing to be wrong. Um, I think it would be great to compile a list of these sort of hesitations that are, that are probably smaller once you name them and once you have like a way to handle them. This is a good time to mention the, the resources that, that we found out about that have been shared in various spaces as people have been grappling with sort of what is the, um, 
the thing that we can do to kind of positively respond to these kind of terrible situations, right? And um, so the first thing that I want to say is that the the worst response is no response. The worst response is to um, have the the feeling of anxiety, the feeling of fear, the feeling of anger, and feel so stymied by it that you can't do anything. And that you know, I think a lot of people are in that, and will might be in that for a little while. Whether you're a an organizer or you're a teacher or you're just somebody who's in the scene, just like there's this is just too much horrible shit. I can't deal with it. And um, trying to come up with like what are the things you can do that will will make the situation better, that will give you agency as well to feel like you're making a positive contribution t um, to improve your scene, right? Um, so there's, of course, uh, there is a Facebook group called Safety Dance. I love that name, by the way. Uh, that uh, is a really great space for just talking about these issues, both as a dancer, as organizers, as just human beings. Um, I think you have to I think you have to apply to become a member of that group. I'm not sure. Um, there's also a Tumblr that's been started by uh, um, uh, uh, Pomona Lake called safespacedance.tumblr.com. That a, has a compilation of resources and uh, really, uh, uh, I think, is trying to build this space for people to kind of just find stuff when you're looking for things. Um, there are a number of other organizations that, of course, have done pioneering work on this ahead of us, and maybe Gina can help us point to that. Uh, we can post that to our respective um, uh, websites later. Um, and of course, there's all these codes of conduct that lots of people are already innovating out there. There's, we've already talked about Lindy Focus, there's Mobtown Ballroom, which maybe Jerry can speak a little bit to how that, um, how that got initiated. Um, Fog City Stomp um, here in the Bay Area also um, has put out their um, code of conduct. Um, Boston Lindy Hop has a really good one as well. Um, so people are trying to um, create this kind of uh, at least official policies and responses from the from the organizer level and and kind of get that out there. So um, there are some positive steps that people are doing that we can all start to look at as a community. And we as community members can also talk to the events that we are attending and like insist that they have these codes of conduct for us. Just so you know, like, if there's an event that you're super keen on, you notice that they don't have a code of conduct, you can always poke the organizers and say, like, hey, this is really important to us. We want to save community. Don't you want to save community, too? Let's get on this. And there are some great templates out there. I think Mobtown was actually the first code of conduct that we had in the Lindy Hop scene. I could be wrong about that. Um, and the fact that others have followed suit, and it, it's actually, it, it sounds formal code of conduct. Um, it sounds like something that you would sign at work or something like that, but the language can be really simple. It can be heartfelt. It doesn't have to be very long. Um, and there are templates out there that we can use to create our own codes of conduct for our own communities. I would love to see one for every weekend dance event, for every uh, studio that teaches dance. I think this is a, a really great step. I also wanted to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Gina. Oh, I was just going to jump in and say, like, I totally agree 100%. Um, I, I can't remember who said that. I was reading it on comments on some Facebook conversation. Um, but basically that codes of contact um, are really helpful and valuable, but by themselves um, won't really help anything. And that is really uh, part of a culture that we all sort of should try, strive to create in our various spaces where the code of conduct is formal expression of that culture. Um, but if it's just, you know, some paragraphs that live on your website and, and that's the beginning and end of it, um, I don't think it's going to be that valuable. I do think it has value as the representation of stated goals of a community. Just as people have been posting on their Facebook pages that I pledge such and such. I think um, they certainly need to be backed up by actions. But I think that just the manifestation of these concepts in these codes or in people's personal pledges at least represents to the community how important this is. So I can quietly live by a code of conduct that I've set for myself and not tell anyone about it but that's not necessarily going to make people around me think like, 
oh shit, I better not be a jerk around Nicole because she will call me on it. Unless it's unless I put it out there like I will call you on it. If you are taking advantage of people, if you are plying 16 year olds with alcohol, I will come up to you and tell you that you need to stop doing that. Or I will tell organizers that this is happening. Um, so I think it's like a they, they definitely need to be backed up by actions. It can also help, I think, to, uh, you know, to, to make it in sight, in mind, as much as possible. So they walk into the door, and the code of conduct is right there, right where they pay their money. And the person says, make sure you read this before you go inside. At night on yeah. the announcements, the MC says, hello, welcome to our local swing thing. Here's the code of conduct. Read it, and make sure that other people are paying attention to that. Something that we've been... Uh, working with with the jam seller crew ever since this happened is uh, we're some of the things we're discussing are having our some of our instructors organizers and volunteers professionally trained uh, in handling sexual assault and and you know uh, uh, those kinds of things um, we've also wait I had it oh uh, and for things like safe spaces uh, I was talking with a Friend of mine who's a, a doctor, and when I, I was I was I was complimenting the safe spaces thing, and he was talking about okay, well, what do lawyers like? How do they work that out with lawyers? How do they like get that? Uh, because and I didn't realize this that there are some implications involved with learning about news of something, and in some cases you have to take you have to send the police report or you have to like let someone know that a crime had happened if you knew that one happened uh, so I know we're, we're basically trying to approach it in trying to think of a lot of the professional ways of doing this uh, to get a good effect I guess is the best way of saying it I wanted to oh. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I, just, well, I wanted to go off of what you what you said, and, and the same thing, uh, just kind of giving suggestions of of just being better people. <laughs> you know, I know I say that generally, but I I mean so much more beyond that because when you see this stuff happen, it's, it's anything. It, just go ahead and out, go up and talk to these people. Man, one of my best friends out here in California. Is uh, he's a teacher at, at Atomic Ballroom. I mean, I don't lo no longer work there, but I know that ballroom is a lot safer because he's there. I mean, he he he's like sort of my Jiminy Cricket. He'll call me on anything I might be doing wrong, and he has he doesn't care who I am, where I've been, or whatever. He just cares that he wants to be morally upstanding. Always, 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 and I can always count on him to tell me the truth, and that's the, that's. That's something to me that I feel like lacking in my life, to be honest. And when I see it through him, I, I want to aspire to be like that. So I'm telling, if anybody watches this video after it comes out, I'm telling all the guys out there, it's not a bad thing to want to be better, to want to, and also to go out there and just confront somebody that, that's doing something really that you feel is inappropriate. And at the same turn, you know, we're not all perfect. So I know I've made plenty of mistakes. And it's really, really hard, but I've learned to apologize. And apologize without having to tell a story about why I did it. No, just straight out apologize and be okay with that. Yeah, Mikey, I think that's a really good point that we're all human, and especially in times of stress, we make poor decisions which is not to excuse any of those decisions, but to always aspire to better ones. And that we all, as a collection of humans who haven't sexually assaulted someone, are still participating in this culture that allows this to happen. And so examining ourselves, doing a little introspection, and thinking about the ways that we can be better about it is always a good use of our time. I also wanted to point out something else that you said before um, when you were talking about understanding how privilege works. Um, I think that's super awesome, for one. Um, so there's all different kinds of privilege, right? There's um, race privilege. I, as a white person, pretty much never have to walk, worry about walking down the street and um, having someone be afraid of me because I'm walking towards them. 
or to have my intentions misread by police. Um, it really helps you understand your own privileges in this. So I would love to see people in positions of authority in the community. There's nothing, it's not your fault necessarily that you are in positions of power over other people. But being mindful of the fact that you are and how that can play into your relationships with them is something I would love for everyone to examine. So people who are teachers, just be aware of the fact that when you ask a student to do something, they almost certainly are going to say yes to whatever it is that you want them to do because they're invested in the relationship and you, in general, have the power in that situation. I feel like organizers are in a similar position. Um, people who have authority, people who are older have more power. Um, if there's alcohol in a situation, the sober person, barring other dissimilarities in power structures, have power. Um, there's a lot of systems in place here where you could not in, even realize that you're taking advantage of a, a structure of power. Um, and just be mindful of the ways in which you have responsibility and make sure that you're not using them in ways to get what you want that aren't really fair. I want to jump in and say, well, I, I think the, ma the main... The, uh, the main question which I think Nicole and Mikey have brought up is that I, it, it's well and good that we're encouraging a culture, starting to encourage a culture where people are paying more attention, paying attention more to themselves and also paying attention to the people around them. Uh, but there, what, what there seems to be what I hope that we're, we're going to work towards is trying to address how to uh, how do we address this? Uh, how to, basically, how to call each other out. I mean, it's easy to call out the creepy guy in the corner. I, I feel like that's low hanging fruit. I mean, like, what are what is the best way for me to call out Mikey? At, at the next event for what I think is something weird. Or if I want to call out Nicole, I think you're being very inappropriate right now. And it's, uh, we're, in, we're in the middle, we're in, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but that's like, that's the dynamic that we're looking at. Because, uh, because what, what happened, uh, what, is what, what triggered all these things was that a person in power did, took advantage of that. And they took advantage of that in front of everyone. And everyone saw it and they just kind of, okay. And then they go, and everyone just kind of meandered off and uh, shrugged it off. Uh, and the people who knew better, I mean, it's, a, it's one thing for, like, the new, the new person to, to walk away because they have no idea. But, like, a lot of people were not surprised by a lot of, I mean, we're still kind of horrified by, like, a lot of what these things are. A lot of people were just not surprised. And... It would have been nice if people just stopped and said, "Hey, you are doing something." And I don't know how exactly do that without, you know, the, the term witch hunt keeps getting thrown around, uh, which is totally legit. But somehow we have to start encouraging a culture amongst ourselves, like not amongst ourselves, but like amongst uh, the people who are really deeply rooted into the scene. To, so to develop some sort of a accountability and a reception to be accountable to other people. I don't know what that, how that is or how we're going to do that, but that's, uh, I think that's like one of the main things that we need to address. Yeah, I think that um, what, it, what we're going to see in public is only ever going to be the tip of the iceberg. So you're never, I, I think you're almost never going to see, man, I hope you're never going to see someone get sexually assaulted in front of you. I feel like that's a, a situation in which probably more of us would feel empowered to be like, hey, this is wrong. Um, but I probably think that what will happen more is that you'll have a vague feeling of dis-ease with smaller instances of aggression against other people. Um, not enough for you to say this was illegal, this one incident, but probably enough for you to feel uncomfortable and unclear about what's going on in this situation. And 
yeah, it's better to start talking about these at the warning signs before someone has to come forward and say, I was sexually assaulted. Like, let's stop it in its tracks before it even happens by being accountable to each other. The people that you're close to in your life, I mean, the people that you're not even that close to in your life, if you feel comfortable doing it. Um, but I would love to have all my friends um, feel okay with coming up and telling me, like, Nicole, when you're drunk, you get flirty in a way that's inappropriate or whatever. And that gives me an opportunity to, like, use the lens of the way other people experience me to say, oh, shit, they might be right in a way that I might not have noticed myself. So like, be accountable for your own actions. Um, speak up to your friends if they're doing things that you think are, like, a little weird or whatever. And if after that conversation you're left with a feeling like, I don't think they heard me and I'm still kind of worried, I think that's an that's a chance for you to talk to other people and like make sure that the situation is addressed. Yeah, no, that's really good. It's really well put, Nicole. Um, so, folks, we are getting close to the hour, so I'm feeling like um, this is, of course, not the end of this conversation, but perhaps um, we should be wrapping up this online part of our conversation anyway. Uh, if we could maybe just go around and each person, if there's um, either a, a next step that you're thinking about or either for your for the scene or something that you're thinking that, about doing, um, if we could all just kind of put something out there that uh, for you is like your action item or something that you're taking away from this. And I'm happy to, to start. Um, I, work at a, um, I work at a museum and at my museum we of course work with a, a wide variety of audiences including lots of young people and uh, very, very diverse uh, populations that come through our door. And we have our policies. We have ways that we respond to all sorts of inappropriateness and uh, uh, different kinds of activities. And uh, I want to learn from other communities that, that already have learned a lot and how do we apply that to our dance community in a way that really doesn't reinvent the wheel but, but really builds upon things that other institutions, whether it's schools, libraries, dance schools, um, other dance communities that have confronted this so that we're not only that we're building upon this culture that we want to create and contributing back to that culture so that I can go to other dancers that I work with and say, hey, this is how Lindy Hoppers are dealing with this in a positive way and this is uh, maybe something that you can learn from. Um, uh, maybe I'll pass it to Bobby since I think he has something I want to say. Yeah, uh, so I'm, this is actually kind of throwing it to the rest of the group. I was talking to a friend of mine about this and about uh, she had worked very closely with some uh, friends of hers who had gone through rape. And she was mentioning that, yes, they were very courageous to come forward. One thing that's going to be very hard for them is the fact that they're going to be constantly reminded of of their statements because of the widespread power of the community and of posting it all over the place and uh, and I was wondering I guess this kind of throwing it out there especially to those on our panel who are I think very well qualified to give some good insight into this how should we how should we react now with those victims or what's maybe the best way that we can go forward with with them in mind I think it's probably an individual thing and checking in with um, those that you care about and say like how would you like me to handle this especially because the thing that they've lost if they were raped or sexually assaulted is agency um, so just putting them in charge of the way that their situation is handled is probably the kindest thing that you can do for them I think cool. I don't know if anyone else disagrees or <laughs> Rebecca or Gina, did you have anything else you wanted to put in? Um, well, I was I was thinking a couple things. Um, one, something that's come up in conversations that I've had is that, particularly for local teens, that you know the people who come to your dance from the local college who have no idea who Stephen Mitchell is and like probably have never heard of Frankie Manning, like they're just there to swing dance and have a good time. Um, they still are affected by this, and so there's. And potentially some concern or discomfort around making awareness about sexual assault and sexual harassment in the scene overly prominent because it would be like scary or 
turn people away or seem like it's this really big problem um, compared to other places. So I'm just hoping, I guess, that um, local leaders can really kind of step up and um, take the position. They're like, no, this is the responsible thing to do, and we're not trying to like scare anybody, but we just want to let you know, you know, like we are here to make sure that everybody has a good time um, and that nobody gets hurt, and this is part of that. Um, so that's kind of one aspect, and I think the other thing I was thinking about for myself personally, and having done um, a lot of work, kind of trying to educate uh, people around these issues and, and bring the conversation forward, is that people are going to be in different places. Um, with regard to their familiarity, what they kind of understand about rape and sexual assault. And so when we're having these conversations, like we need for some people, like they are really at, you know, point A, and some people are down at like point L or M, and it's going to be hard to have those two people having a conversation together. Um, so I think it's okay to, to separate those kinds of things and say, like, okay, here's some basic stuff that a lot of people need to get caught up on, and then for those of us who maybe have been thinking, talking about for longer, we can have a different kind of conversation. Really good point. Rebecca, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I want to say that's really, really great what Gina pointed out. And it's hard to remember sometimes if you've been thinking about it a long time and you just want people to get it already. Um, so th speaking of um, newer dancers or people who don't dance all that often, I wanted to um, say that I know I've seen on Facebook sometimes and elsewhere in life, sometimes um, people get really excited and really impassioned to fix a problem really quickly because it, you know, hits them like a truck and they're like, this is horrible, we need to fix it. And it is really easy to sort of say, okay, okay, victims, we understand what's wrong, we're going to stop all sexual assault, we got it, you know, safe, safe, safe space, policies, codes of conduct, we're good now, we got this. Um, and it's it's easy to like try to move on too quickly to those things, and I just want to, um, for anyone listening, want to remind them to um, like continue to review the victims' stories and continue to listen to people who have been victimized in dancing and um, or in other places, and think also about the people who are most vulnerable, um, like newer dancers. Um, uh, women, um, younger people, um, that's probably not a complete list, but think about them and ask them how they feel and ask them what they need. And don't problem solve based on what you think they need, but on what they say they need and what they're, what they're asking for. Because it's just, it's so easy to just assume you know what the problem is. I mean, I've done that, so I can pretend I know what the problem is if I don't, if I don't ask and if I don't empathize. So, that's my closing thought. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Mikey, what are where where are you at? What are your kind of next steps or thoughts for yourself? Um, I I'm I love this. By the way, I, this is amazing. Um, I, I love that we are talking about this. I love that. Uh, I, <laughs> this is going to sound really weird, and I feel super emotional about it. And it's really hard for me to deal with this because I this is my life. This is real life. This is happening. I've been dancing for 17 years. My family in dancing is my family. And to know this happened, and maybe I saw it and was blind, I blinded myself to it, hurts me a lot. Incredibly. It's, it's This person came in into my life as well and came in and destroyed a lot of other people's lives that I consider very close to me. All I want to say is to people out there that you're watching this, you can make the difference. You can make this just like everybody's been saying. Listen, believe, and really don't just have this, okay, yeah, everybody's doing this. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's fix the problem. Just like Rebecca just said, just fix it. Just fix it. It'll be fine. No, it's going to take time, and it's going to suck, and right now it sucks, and... Uh, I've been dealing with it really hard, uh, really hard, and I didn't know know that until this today. And uh, to anybody out there, I want to say I, I want to apologize. I want to apologize if I missed anything, if I did anything. 
everything. Um, I know that does, probably doesn't mean much, but I know I'm in a position of power, and I know I have this, <clears throat> I have this persona about me that is wild and crazy, and 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 can party and do all this stuff. <sighs> but I think it's time to grow up. I think it's time to change, and I think that's a good thing. So if anybody's watching this, it's 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 time to grow up. It's time to really face forward and and face the future. But it's going to be better. I know it's going to be better, as long as we all come together like we usually do. And I love this whole thing. I love all of the Lindy Hop community. And uh, yeah, that's it. Sorry for this. Sorry. No, don't be sorry. I think we're all feeling with you, Mikey. Jerry, um, a lot of this kind of came from your impetus. Um, what are your feelings about next steps or for yourself or for the community? Um, well, I think Mikey kind of hits right, hits it right on the nose. I, there has been this sort of the feeling that the, the dance community is like this never never land, right? You know, we fly away off to our weekends. We do whatever we do whatever there, and we come back. Um, but there is we we can't really, uh, we can't. Uh, it's yeah, I, don't, I personally don't think it's healthy to look at the community. Uh, look at this activity as something that's divorced from the rest of real life. Um, and this is unfortunately part of the process to reconnect, that uh, reconnects us with, with the real world. Um, there, what I would like to see, or what I would like to see considered, um, I mean, I, in my day job, uh, I'm not allowed to drink. I'm not allowed to have sex. I'm not allowed to even flirt with anyone, or I'm uh, I'm subject to a lot of uh, to any kinds of regulations on these sort of things. And you know, may may and this is tough to consider because it, it does feel like uh, all these weekends and these events feel like family gatherings. But you know, some people are there working, and maybe it's time maybe we need to formalize that a little bit more. And that might mean also sacrificing some of these relationships or changing them at least. Uh, and that's kind of a scary thought. Uh, and it'll change the dynamic in some fashion. But hopefully, uh, I mean, hopefully it'll make it a better place for everyone rather than just kind of like this fun la-la land just for like, a few people. Uh, those are just, that's just a thought uh, about it. One thing I would like to be responsible for, and you all can hold me accountable to it, is making sure that voices are heard and represented. So we have three women on this panel tonight. Um, I, I want to keep pushing for women to be included in conversations about these sorts of things about conversations about all things involving dance because it, I think that we can probably do a little better than we have been about that. Not just voices of women though. Um, I think that gay and trans people have um, very limited access to um, signal boosting in our community and they're probably the ones who are also most at risk for these kinds of situations where they can be taken advantage of. Um, so we need to give them an opportunity to be part of the conversation as well and have their voice heard alongside, alongside women, alongside um, victims who have experienced these situations. I think we just need to be really careful about making sure that people are heard. Um, and I think that that's probably one of the best things that's come out of this, I think, is that the voices are being heard. They're not being brushed under the rug. They're not being minimized. And for the most part, there aren't that many trolls who are telling them that they're crazy. I want to keep pushing to make that the case going forward. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I hate to be the moderator 
person <laughs> at this point because I feel like we we're all kind of you know in the shared space and I really appreciated everyone's time but I also want to be respectful of everyone's time um, and uh, just thank all of you guys for for taking time out of your days and your evenings to be with us here in this conversation and again to reiterate that this is the beginning for many of us of this conversation and that uh, I think we can all expect on our respective uh, online and offline presences that people will continue to be talking to that talking to these issues with us um, so um, after this we'll share information um, with the community who's watching this about how you can get in touch with all of us um, just uh, on behalf of myself I just want to thank all of you guys so Jerry, Gina, Mikey, Nicole, Rebecca, Bobby and Manu uh, all of you guys for just being here and, and sharing sharing your thoughts um, and uh, I personally am feeling uh, both sad and uh, also a little bit hopeful about the next steps for our community and um, uh, I think you know kind of want to get to the next level where we're talking to other organizers about things that they're doing you know three months from now that are really creating positive steps um, for everybody uh, in our community so thank you guys again and um, uh, we'll keep talking about this thank you guys thank you guys thank you good night good night